Fantastic. Um, welcome. I see some new faces and um, faces who I don't know yet. Um, I'm thrilled that we have come together to dig a little bit deeper into uh, the halachic underpinnings of breastfeeding. Um, you will hear all of our speakers say that there are many ways to feed our babies um, and we don't only um, think that breastfeeding is the way, but we, uh, we, we know that there are a lot of questions that come up around breastfeeding. And so we have launched this three-part series to explore all uh, questions that we have already heard, and we wanted to, to share them back with you. Um, we've had the idea to, to really break up how we're thinking about the, uh, the evening, um, not only looking at halacha, but to look at hashkafa, to look at some chasidut, um, and to look at some practical application. And so um, and we also want to thank our partners uh, who are joining us. Um, thank you to Sviva, to Ariel Morkovitz, Mazal Tov to you, um, and also to uh, Jofa and to the folks there. Um, and so we want to begin and open up tonight with uh, Rabbi Dr. Aaron Leib Smokler, who is um, the Rebbe at Maharat. Um, and I, what I mean by that is our spiritual guide, our Madricha Ruchanit, our Dean of Students, um, and also our Rebbe and Chassidut. So turning it over to you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much and welcome to everybody on this snowy evening for those of you, at least on the East Coast. Um, it is a pleasure to be with all of you to reflect on a topic that is of great personal significance to me and not one that we often have a chance to air in public. Um, and so I'm really grateful to, for all, to all the partners tonight for giving us all an opportunity to honestly reflect on um, something that is very intimate for many of us and also an area that um, as a result of its intimacy, we often experiment with um, without having public discourse about. So um, one other note of introduction, I know that Rabbi Sarah said this or alluded to this already, and that is that um, our topic for this series is breastfeeding. Um, and our greatest hope is that babies get fed however they can be fed, however is best for that particular um, mother and baby dyad. Um, but we will be focusing on, on breastfeeding itself which is something that I have great experience in, thankfully. Um, I wanted to just share as a frame the way that I, or one of the ways that I think about this enterprise, um, and that is through the lens of El Shaddai. One of the names of God, El Shaddai, often translated as God Almighty, um, is interpreted it differently, shall we say, both in the rabbinic mind and also later in the Hasidic mind. Um, we find multiple midrashim that refer to El Shaddai as Anihu she'amarti le'olam dai. I am the one who said to the world, enough. And there are multiple interpretations of what that means. Um, but one is, I am the God who provides sufficiently for the world. I give the world die, I give the world what it needs. Both in light of this strand and also building on it, there is another tradition that sees in the word Shaddai, the word Shaddaim, which are breasts in Hebrew. And the idea of a God with breasts is an interesting one. <laughs> a God who gives, a God who nurtures, um, if you look at the biblical references to El Shaddai, all but one are in the fertility context, um, suggesting that this is not a coincidence, but something profound about one of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways that we might actually think about God or be in relationship to God. And I find that to be very, very provocative as an image. Um, and also profoundly inspiring as a woman, and as a mother, to imagine that to walk in God's ways might also be to provide sustenance, to give nourishment, 
protection, love, attachment, and all of that um, through our bodies. And so the degree to which this is godly work to me seems very present in our tradition and the necessity thus to support it in whatever ways we can also seems to be a profound responsibility. And so um, tonight we're going to have a discussion with Rabbi Nitlai Asarna about some of the halachic issues that arise, particularly when we have challenges in breastfeeding or needs to sustain breastfeeding that might conflict with some other values. And I think it's a useful frame to open with as we contend with the idea of a God of breasts, a God as mother, God as nurturer, and what it might mean for us to actually walk in those ways. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rabbi Nitlai Asarna. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Erin. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I am so thrilled to be um, sharing some Torah with you tonight, and we're specifically going to be looking at McCrote about um, pumping, using an electric pump to pump breast milk on Shabbat, and we are going to do that through some slides. Um, okay. Um, so just to be clear, because this is part of a series, so tonight we're going to be talking about just extracting milk on Shabbat. And then on Wednesday, we're gonna get in with um, my colleagues or my teacher of Jeff and my colleague, um, Melissa Skolton Gutierrez and others about what you can then do with that said extracted um, extracted milk. So today is just the extraction and it's a, it's a little bit like artificial to separate them as you'll learn more about on Wednesday, I think. Um, but uh, that that's just for the purposes of having a series, that's how we're doing it. Um, okay, so as everyone said, just we're going to go through some, some, some important pieces of like orienting um, philosophy, I suppose. So first things first, fed is best. Um, as, as everyone so far has said, you know, however you and your baby make it work, amazing. Um, but another piece that to me feels just really important is that feeding your baby one kind of nutrition six days a week and a different kind of nutrition one day a week is somewhere between impossible and dangerous. So sometimes when you'll hear people talking about pumping on Shabbat, they'll say, well, you have to pump because formula is dangerous. And I would say, I don't need to say something like that, which first of all, I don't believe, but second of all, it's not, I don't think that in order to get to where we need to get halachically, I don't think we need to say that. I think all we need to say is that if you, let's say you're a, a person who exclusively pumps, if you are doing that every day and then on Shabbat, you're like, oh, today I'm not going to pump and I'm going to give my baby formula. Um, that's not going to work well, not for you, not for your baby. So um, that I think is kind of enough and puts us into a sufficiently dangerous situation um, to get us to where we need to go. And more on that as we get into this further. Um, mastitis is dangerous. I remember uh, when I was pregnant, I went to the eye doctor and the eye doctor was like, don't get mastitis. It's bad for your eyes. And I was like, that is like not even the beginnings of it. Um, and um, uh, more on that potentially from, from Dr. Abraham, uh, Rabbi Dr. Abraham uh, later, but, but that's another piece that we're contending with. It's not just the well-being of the baby, it's also the well-being of, of mom. Um, also, parental mental health really matters. And that's something else that we're taking very seriously when we're talking about um, breastfeeding and just the time in life in which people breastfeed. Um, women are not cows, even if it kind of feels like it sometimes. They're not cows, we are not cows. Um, every baby feeding journey is unique, often expensive, often hard. People say this kind of ludicrous thing, like you should breastfeed because it's cheaper, um, which is just a hysterical thing to say because lactation consultants are not cheaper and all the equipment you need is not cheaper and pumping is not cheaper and your time is valuable and all of those things. Um, but, but when we talk about this, obviously everyone has their own um, journey or their friend's journey or some journey that they are intimately involved with um, in their minds. And we should always recognize that like my journey wasn't the same as someone else's journey um, in something that's kind of this, this intimate and difficult and beautiful and all the things. Um, also, uh, no matter how you feed your baby, you're awesome. Let's get to it. So um, when I, um, not to like be like too autobiographical, but when I was setting, when I was expecting and thanks to Obamacare, pumps are now, a certain level of, of breast pump is now free. So I was sort of like, great, uh, I'll get one just because it's free. And it didn't occur to me that I would ever need to pump on Shabbat. 
because I was sort of like, okay, if I'm pumping, it's because I'm back at work and I have to like keep my pump with me and go somewhere. And the pump is what will enable me to be not with my baby all the time. But it, why would I ever need, like, I'll just, if my baby is breastfeeding, I'll just be with my baby on Shabbat. I would never want to be away from my baby for a child. Um, even in this, you know, crazy career path that I have chosen. Um, still, I would probably want to bring my baby with me. So like, I'll get it, but probably only going to use it on the day. There are a lot of reasons why somebody might need to come on Shabbat, um, even if when they set out having, they, when they were pregnant, they didn't realize or think that they would ever would have to. So if your baby has latch issues that cannot be overcome or you don't want to overcome them, then you would exclusively pump um, or you don't want to breastfeed, you just want to pump, then you're an exclusive pumper, you're going to be pumping on Shabbat. If your baby always gets some pumped milk, so you're not an exclusive pumper, but still the way that your baby gets breast milk is via a pump and your baby gets a regular mix of formula and pumped milk, then that's gonna be something you're doing on Shabbat. Um, if your baby normally nurses, but today is not and is instead screaming, then you're probably gonna to wanna to be pumping on Shabbat. Your baby is getting supplemented with bottle feeds and in order to grow your supply, you would need to pump. Um, that's another really important reason why a lot, a lot, a lot of moms, especially in those first couple of weeks or months might be pumping on Shabbat. Maybe you're trying to avoid mastitis. Maybe you have an oversupply. Maybe your baby can latch, but only after you pump a little bit because of like shape or texture or just like the baby can't deal with like that first gush of milk. That can also happen. Um, you might be pumping in addition to breastfeeding in order to grow your supply. You might have a clogged duct that you got to get rid of or else that thing could get infected. Um, and this list is not exhaustive. So many people who come into their breastfeeding journey assuming I'll never have to pump on Shabbat find themselves pumping on Shabbat for all sorts of reasons. So I think that's just a really, really important point um, when we're talking about pumping that it's not just like some unusual like, oh, mom had to be away from her baby or like, oh, that like one person who exclusively pumps. We'll talk more about um, like a little bit about like the history of exclusive pumping because it's relatively recent-ish. Um, but that it's just increasingly, increasingly normal as pumps get better, get better and better. Um, okay, so here's the total part. So I have to move you guys. Okay. Um, okay, so this is just some like background about the way we think about babies and milk. So we have a baby. This is a bright day in, in your vamos in the context is like we're talking about children eating non-kosher food. But here, so we have, we have a tash my unique to know for leech me out of that for me behemat mea, the in hoshishim the unique shaka. So a baby is allowed to nurse from a non Jewish woman. It can even nurse from a non kosher animal. Now, remember, we don't eat, we don't drink the milk of non kosher animals. That's like a big component in um, kashrut of dairy products. And, uh, but a baby, a baby can, a baby can nurse directly off of a non kosher animal. And we don't worry about, any like it being like um, sucking from a detestable creature, Rashi here says, Lomarshi unique shakets, Klomar Devarha Meshukat Vanessar, something we don't think about it as something that's like disgusting or something that's prohibited um, in the way that we might if that were um, an adult. And but at the same time, so we say yes, any kind of milk, but not any kind of um, solid. So you do not feed your baby. Um, you know, animal carcasses, animals that have wounds, that they're a trefa, um, anything that's like disgusting, any non-kosher meat, basically, you cannot feed to your baby. So we're looking at a difference between a baby that's relying on milk versus a baby that's eating solids. Once you have a human that's eating solids, you start to like not give them not kosher food. Um, okay, and then, but back to milk for a second. Umikulan yonik mehen afil b'shabat. And, and the baby can nurse, even on Shabbat, so you, it probably doesn't really cross anyone's mind that like maybe you can't nurse on Shabbat, but here's the Gemara coming along to say, not only can you yes nurse on Shabbat, but you can even, you know, nurse from your non-Jew, nurse from your camel, nurse from your whatever it is, right? Any, any source of milk for the baby is fine on Shabbat. Um, however, an adult cannot, like let's say um, an adult, well, we're gonna get, the Gemara is gonna discuss this in a second, but, but an adult has um, probably cannot nurse on, on Shabbat. Okay. Um, so just like a funny thing is that like, right, why is like, it's just crazy to imagine like a baby nursing off of a camel. So 
maybe that you trim a gin is like camel milk in the following. Um, okay, so so the Gemara says, hold on, Tanya in Hoshichin be unique shakets. It says um, you don't need to be concerned that this baby is sucking from a um, not from a from like a disgusting not kosher animal. Hata mishum sakana. So, but hold on. So, if the baby's allowed to do it, it's because the baby's in danger. And ihachi gadol nami. But then an adult really should be allowed to also because presumably an adult is also in danger. So, like if a baby's only allowed to do it because they're in danger, then presumably like the, the adult in danger would similarly be allowed to do that. So, what, who cares about the distinction between an adult and a baby? Um, the Gemara answer is Gadol by Umbuna Katan. So Gadol by Umbuna. An adult requires consultation. If an adult is going to be consuming like camel milk or whatever, then the adult um, it needs a, needs like a doctor's note, it needs a doctor's order. So that the Gemara says, ah, oh, Katanami by Umbuna. Okay, so the, the baby maybe also should require a, a doctor's order to, to be consuming food in this way. Amar Kuna Brazer Rabbi Yeshua. So Kuna Brazer Rabbi Yeshua says, "No, stam tino pesukan at al chalav." And that's like very important principle. In, in any case, in a stam case, an unspecified case, a child is in danger with regards to milk. Stam tino pesukan at al chalav, which um, which then means, right? So baby, you don't need to go ask. Like in order to feed your baby, feed your baby in any way, feed your baby on Shabbat in any way. That seems to be like really the thrust of the Gemara, right? So if you just read this Gemara, you would be like, for sure, I can do whatever it takes to get my baby the nutrition my baby needs on Shabbat because my baby is always in a pikuach nefesh kind of situation. And that's the assumption. I don't need to ask. I don't need anything. Stam to your misukan at the Okay, but it gets more complicated because this is a Tusefta that is not brought into the Gemara. So the status of anything that's in the Tusefta that's then not brought into the Mishnah, not brought into the Gemara, well, whatever, okay. Um, it depends which order you think the Tusefta and the Mishnah appeared in. But at any event, any Tusefta that does not appear in the Gemara has like a questionable kind of halakhic status, but then it's kind of on the ritual name on the medieval commentators to either bring it in or not bring it in. So we have this Tusefta, which seems to kind of really go in a different um, direction, which, right, which is, So the, the, I'm in the bolded part here, a woman should not release milk from her breasts or express milk into a cup or into a dish in order to um, nurse her child. So here we have, like what seemed like, for, if we just looked at the Gemara and Yvonne, we would say, whatever it takes to feed your baby, like don't think twice, don't ask anyone, go do it. And here, all of a sudden, we have a oh, woman should not hand express um, in order to feed her child. She shouldn't hand express maybe like even right into the child mouth, shouldn't hand express um, into a cup and then feed that to the child. Um, so first of all, why is that? Great question. We'll get there. Second of all, um, like what is like, how can you even say something like that, right? Like, do, are we concerned that the baby is like, gonna, babies need milk? Like what, like what's going on in this situation? So, um, so the Tosefta in context makes very clear what's not going on in this situation, which is what's not going on in this situation is the baby needs the milk because the baby is in danger, right? Because what happens here directly is if anyone is in danger, Mutar, it's allowed. Shein Koldavaro made me save you Kuach because nothing stands in the way of saving a life except for a Vodazar Gilera Chukadami, except for idol idolatry, forbidden sexual relationships, and so on. So even in this like first source that kind of begins to say, oh, like expressing milk has um has like a Shabbat problematic to it, already there, like really in like kind of blaring headlights. But if anyone's in danger, like ignore. Okay, so that's like really important um, piece of this Tosefta that ultimately um, when you like read it being quoted, you kind of lose that that background in it, but but just like know that it's kind of baked in from the start. And and this is then we have, you know, the classic Gemara that, that you're probably familiar with of the fact king you have nefesh for Shabbat, right? You, you engage in saving a life on Shabbat, that the reason is in the Shabbat, but answer is told her should be vegan. And anyone who's vigilant to save lives on Shabbat is praiseworthy and you should not take permission. And in fact, you know, in the version of this in the Yerushalmi, it says, if you, if you like ask permission, you've killed someone already. Like it's really like, we're quite 
um, we're quite strict about uh, about pikuach nefesh on Shabbat. And then what are the examples? I didn't bring them all for you here because I really don't have enough time for this. But like, what are the examples the Gemara brings? Each and every case, well, not exactly, but the vast majority of cases the Gemara then brings are about babies. So like really, who is the Gemara imagining is in danger? Like children, babies, babies are in danger. The minute we're talking about breast milk, we're saying, oh, well, she shouldn't like self-express, but hand express, but like the minute anyone's in danger, like forget what we just said. Okay, so. We're just holding all of that. I'm gonna tie it all together. Now we're talking about this. Okay, so here we start to see how, how it comes together that this two have to win. So we're seeing here the Beit Yosef quoting. I'm not gonna actually read through this. We'll read we'll read um, the Beit Yosef's formulation of this in the Shulchan Aruch. But here we're seeing the Beit Yosef quoting the Shibu Eleket, quoting the Mordechai who are taking this to Safta and saying like, yes, lehalacha, women should not be hand expressing on on Shabbat. Now remember, like breast pumps as we have them, like women did not have, right? So hand expressing is what we would now call a breast pump. Um, and here we're already seeing um, um, Ashkenaz commentators bringing, um, um, medieval commentators bringing this to Sefta like into the halachic core. And then we have it now in the Shulchan Aruch, where the Shulchan Aruch says, Lo takali women should not um, lighten milk from her breast into a cup or into a bowl and feed that to her son. But he does say, <laughs> but she is allowed to um, express so that her child will latch. So that's kind of interesting already. We have a little bit of a like, oh, there's there's something like complicated here going on in the sense that like, if she, if this is essential, I think, for the child to eat, the Shulchan Aruch already knows if it's essential for the child to eat, then you, on Shabbat, it's allowed. Um, and the Mishnah Brewer here comes and explains what, you'll look at these sources, I think, more in depth with um, Rav Jeff on Wednesday. But um, what is, what's going on? Why is, right, when we saw Josephta, Josephta didn't say, what's actually the problem with, with hand expression on Shabbat, right? Like, I can touch all my other body parts on Shabbat. I can urinate on Shabbat. I can, you know, some Dead Sea, Dead sea sects didn't think you should defecate on Shabbat, but like, we don't have a problem with that. Like lots of our other bodily fluids flow on Shabbat um, and no problem. But um, the Mishnah Bura says, and, and this is based in some other remarks, um, that the problem with hand expression on Shabbat is mefaric. Now it's really important to understand what mefaric is. It's actually quite complicated. Um, but in the eyes of the Mishnah Bura, by the time we get to like this late in Halakha, mefaric is, um, is a tolda of dash. So dash is threshing. And then when you have an avalacha, which is like the, one of the 39 primary categories of prohibited activity on Shabbat, when you have subcategories within that category, there's still Torah level violations of Shabbat. They're just kind of subcategories in the way that you think about them. So mefarik is a, is a subcategory of dash and mefarik is the Torah level prohibition on removing one thing that is within another thing. So similarly, you can't squeeze grapes on Shabbat, you can't squeeze olives on Shabbat, um, and you can't squeeze breasts on Shabbat. Um, so, or at least theoretically, I'll stay with me. Um, and um, okay, so that's that's kind of the that's the Mishnah Bura. And the Mishnah Bura explaining what's what's wrong with hand expression on Shabbat in the eyes of the Shulchan Aruch, and it's important to understand that it's a Torah level in the eyes of the Shulchan Aruch Mishnah Bura. It's a Torah level prohibition to hand express on Shabbat. And I know it sounds really extreme, but just just stay with us. Stay with us. Okay. So just as a reminder, where we started, feeding your baby one kind of food six days a week and a different kind of food one day a week is impossible slash dangerous, right? And we talked about all the gazillion reasons why someone might need to come. Also, it's really important to remember that like for us to say, oh, it's dangerous, the Talmud didn't understand that it's dangerous. Please let that thought not ever enter your minds again. These people knew exactly how endangered children and mothers were. Children and mothers died all of the time. For them, it's crazy that it would ever occur to us to do anything that might put our babies and our mothers in danger because we have such great um, rates of survival that like we're just in like a completely different planet from them. But don't think like, oh, they didn't understand like babies would die. No, they understood and they would tell you if anything could possibly cause harm to your baby or harm to a mother, don't do it obviously, which we saw reflected actually so beautifully in that Tosefta, which is like a difficult Tosefta to read, but that it jumps directly 
from a woman hand expressing to Vikuach Nachash, I think is just so reflective of their deep understanding of like everything involved in this is actually high stakes and everything involved in this is dangerous. And the minute it's dangerous, do not pass go, do not collect $200, like just do what you gotta do. Um, and so I think that's just like a really, really, really important um, way to read these texts in the Gemara and in the Halacha and, and just put yourself into their shoes. Like they knew how dangerous things were. We do not have to explain. Uh, we do not have to explain that like back into Halacha. So then the question is, okay, so who were they talking to? Like when the Tosafta says a woman should not hand express, if we're going to assume that they knew full well how dangerous the whole situation was, then who are they talking to? Who should not hand express on Shabbat? Who should not use a pump on Shabbat? So maybe they're talking to women who are producing more than what their children need and parentheses, not, um, not having problems with messing. Maybe they're talking to women who are nursing toddlers or beyond. The Gemara describes people nursing for much longer than the vast majority of people who nurse today nurse for. Um, maybe they're, so you're talking about a child who is not dependent on their mother's milk for survival. Nursing is providing something else in their life. Maybe they're talking about um, someone pumping who just doesn't need to pump. Now, okay, so that's like a little bit of a complicated um, situation, but like, I will say that like I primarily um, nursed on Shabbat, but there was a time when I was like nursing my son's full nutrition. And then in addition, I was pumping because I knew someday he was gonna go to daycare. And so I was pumping an extra time, like at 5 a.m. So, um, so that I would just like have a freezer staff. So while I was doing that, I did not do that pump, that 5 a.m. pump on Shabbat. I would do that six days a week, not on Shabbat. I had plenty of supplies for him on Shabbat. Um, I did not want to be contributing to my freezer stash on Shabbat because I didn't need to be. It was not for my child's like current well-being. Um, and I was making plenty the other six days of the week for my future freezer stash. And I was not in danger of mastitis while, while skipping a pumping session. So that's, that would be kind of one of these rare cases where you're pumping six days a week, but you don't need to pump and your baby doesn't need it. So that would be maybe another case where we would say, you know, like there's no people of Nefesh here of you skipping a pumping session. So like skip it, skip it on Shabbat. Um, I'm seeing a lot of stuff happening in the chat, but I can't really see it while I'm doing the like screen share slide thing. So I'm just going to keep moving, but I'm available for questions at any time other than right now. Um, okay. So let's talk about electricity because once you're saying, oh, it's people of Nefesh, you have to, you have to pump on Shabbat. You have to provide the level of nutrition that your child might need and is used to and the type of nutrition your child is used to on Shabbat. So then you might say, okay, but let me use my hand pump because then at least I'm not doing electricity. Um, and I know like electricity is bad. Okay, so here's, here's, here's an important piece about electricity, which is that we, electricity really dominates our Shabbos experience. It dominates our Mukta experience, right? Of like all this stuff in my house that I can't touch on Shabbat, lights that I normally turn off and on that I don't turn off and on, my phone that I'm addicted to, my computer and my Zoom screen that I can't leave behind. Like, wow, Shabbat is when I unplug. And that experientially is like a huge part of Shabbos today. However, on like a technical halachic level, there are, electricity is at the very least complicated. So this is just, I pulled this just from a great article by Rabbi Broyden, Rabbi Jack Dar, um, and um, they go through all the different perspectives and opinions about what might be wrong with electricity. But what you'll notice is even the opinions that say that it's uh, the oraita. So that's number two, number three, um, number four, number five, and number six are all um, like maybe the oraita level ish. Not everyone who says, it, oh, it's connected to this thinks it's the oraita, but whatever, that's complicated. Um, even then, so if you were to use electricity, it would be the same level of prohibition as doing one squeeze on a hand pump, right? One squeeze on a hand pump is mafari, and one plugging in your electric breast pump or turning it on is like cre the creation of one circuit. So just to like talk about electricity versus your breast pump, um, even then, like it's still a question of like how many times did I do the prohibited activity, kind of, if you want to think about it in very concrete terms, like how many uh, korban chatats would I have to bring for doing this? 
uh, right? Like how many animals would I like owe at the end of the day if I like accidentally did a bunch of these things? Right? That's like the way the Talmud likes to think about it because it makes it sort of very concrete. You can like imagine and align all of your like animals that you have to bring to the van. Oh my gosh, um, right? So what, so we try and like minimize the animals, right? That's kind of that's kind of the goal in um, in or like the goal in keeping Shabbat is like no animals, right? But when we're talking about people not that, so it's like can I accomplish exactly the same goal with like as few animals as possible? Um, that's kind of the way we think about it. So, so there's two important things. One is that like number seven here, which is the Fomazam and Arbach, who by the way, like really dominates the way we keep Shabbat because Shabbat Shabbat Kelkata is um, all of the Sakim of Fomazam and Arbach. And also um, our teacher Rabbi Linzer like really believes that this is the way of the future and, and many other um, like luminary Muslim of our time. Um, believe, so that all this should read number seven here, the use of electricity without light or heat is actually permitted, but because observant Jews since the invention of electricity have maintained that it is prohibited to use electrical appliances on Shabbat, and rabbinic authorities approved of the stricture, it is, prohibit, it is prohibited to use such appliances absent great need because of tradition. What that means is, is our tradition very strongly to not use electricity on Shabbat. However, when you're comparing the use of electricity to the malacha of Mefarik, which is an Isser de Oreta, there's no comparison. So if you buy into number seven, then there's no comparison. If you buy in to whatever it was, all the other ones that I, right, two through six, uh, if you buy into two through six, then at least it's like a one-to-one -one comparison. And even then, when you're using an electric pump, we'll go through how some of them work in a second, but you're doing maybe like hitting with three different buttons. Like that's kind of maximum when you're hitting three buttons. If you're using a hand pump, then on each breast, you're doing countless pumps. Each pump is his own activity of the party. So that's like really, if you're trying to minimize your, your core button that are lining up, um, you're still winning with an electric pump. Okay. So takeaways, electricity isn't the worst possible thing that you can do on Shabbat. Um, so just as like a comparison between electric and manual. So your manual pump, we're starting in the red, your manual pump cannot be set on a timer. So there's no possibility of any kind of like grumma, something else really causing it, not being sure it's gonna be caused by your activity, any of that, no possibility of that. Um, you can't really effectively use a hand pump in a weird way. Like hand pumps are designed very specifically, they actually require a lot of energy and a lot of like hand strength. Um, and um, you can't you can't really do it with a machine way. Like you can't do it with like an offhand or something. You would not effectively um, extract milk. Um, you would you do many activities of pumping. So there's a lot of prohibited actions. And also it's certainly prohibited at either the seam or a higher level than using electricity. And also just from like an experiential like piece of things, hand pumps are just way less pleasant than electric pumps. Not that electric pumps are like anyone's experience of a good time, but hand pumps are like a thousand times worse. Um, okay, so that as opposed to your electric pumps, so some electric pumps we'll get here can be set on a timer. So that's already grandma. An electric pump can be turned off and on in a weird way. So you can use your knuckles of your non-dominant hand and that all of a sudden gives you a sheet away. You're doing it in a strange way. Maximum, you're hitting like one or two, maybe three buttons. Um, the status of electricity is, is, a, is a win typically, and also just in terms of your experience. And on Shabbat, your experience matters because we value Oneg Shabbos. And for a woman who's nursing, you know, what well, could be like up to, I don't know, 10 times a day, uh, right? If you're, you're you'd be pumping 10 times a day, that's really an awful lot of your Shabbos um, to be spending with a manual pump. Um, okay. So in conclusion, I'm, I'm not I'm not actually done here, but in conclusion of like that little piece of the stuff, I think there's just there's just no comparison that one should one should really be using their electric pump over a hand pump on Shabbat, and one should be using any kind of pump in order to give their baby the nutrition that their baby needs. Okay, so let's just talk about the two major kind of pumps on the market. Um, these are pumps that are available for free through your insurance under the Affordable Care Act as of today. Um, thank God, because the Affordable Care Act like really changed the calculation in terms of pumps um, because they're just like much more common. We'll get to that in a second, um, which means that like new, newer and newer pumps are coming onto the market all the time. Um, so the Spectre pump is one of those like newer pumps from um, South Korea, I think. And it is extremely popular and most women find, or many, many, many women find that it works better than the medulla pumps. The medulla pumps are kind of those originals, 
Medulla was making breast pumps before anybody was. Um, so the good thing about medulla pumps is that they can be set on a timer. And you'll see in a lot of halachic books that they just assume um, that breast pumps can be set on a timer. The Pinei Halacha assumes that a breast pump can be set on a timer. And that's because um, there was a while when the market was just flushed with medulla pump and style. That's what everyone had. The medulla pumps can be set on a timer because they are just a, a switch. And they, so when you're using a breast pump, it'll go into two modes. So it'll have let down mode and, um, and expression mode. Um, and so the medial pump just like naturally, it just switches, not naturally, but it's, it's programmed to just like switch on its own. As opposed to the spectral pump, where you tell it, you hit a button to switch from one mode to the next. Um, and to effectively pump, you need both of those modes. Like you can't just like leave it on one mode and hope that it will work, or at least for most women. Um, so the medial pump, you can set it on a timer. It changes modes automatically. It does not turn off automatically, but you can um, use your timer for that too. So as opposed to the spectral pump, which it must be turned off and on with a button. It uh, must be turned on, sorry, with a button. The spectra actually, this is wrong. It turns, as, as it says in point, point three, the spectra turns off after 30 minutes. Um, and it must be changed from letdown mode to expression mode for a proper use. Um, okay. So basically the ideal thing to do is to use an electric pump on a timer. But the second best thing to do would be to use another electric. Now I would say like most people when they're getting their pump, they're assuming I'm gonna get this pump and I'm gonna leave it at work. What do I need a pump at home for? So that's why like, meaning it's just important to remember that there's a gazillion reasons why someone might pump at home, which means the other piece of things is that when you're getting your Affordable Care Act uh, breast pump, you might wanna consider getting a medulla pump or, or not, and then 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 you're dealing with something that's like slightly less ideal for Shabbos, but probably may well be a better pump, which is the spectral pump. So that's just kind of uh, um, you know something to consider. But because we don't ever talk publicly about using electric pumps on Shabbos, um, nobody when they're like whatever it is, seven months pregnant, and now their insurance qualifies them to buy a breast pump, no one's like, oh well, I'm a from person and I think I might need to pump on Shabbos. No one at that point, no one's seven months pregnant thinks they might need to pump on Shabbos or has even considered that and they have probably assume that if they need a pump on Shabbos, they're going to use a manual pump. So I think some of what we can do um, with this education is sort of like encourage um, potentially the acquisition of medial pumps if, if, if it really becomes clear that they're of equal caliber to the spectral pump. Um, okay, so here's just like a quick how-to. Your medial, you would just set it on a timer before Shabbat. If you're invested in like really maximizing all the timer possibilities. Someone on my Facebook page today was really um, pushing getting like smart timers for this. Um, I couldn't totally follow how that was working, but I'm sure it was right. Um, and um, the other thing is that if you set the timer wrong, you should just move the pins around. Like it's better to move the pins around than to unplug it or to have some kind of um, other mess with that. Um, so you would just set it up before the timer is supposed to go on, you would put it on and then it would just start automatically because it's on the timer. When you're done with it, you would just take it off and then the timer would turn it off. The spectra is a little bit more complicated because it can't be set on a timer. So if you have to use your spectra on Shabbat, you would plug it in before Shabbat where you want it to be. You would turn it on in an abnormal way. You would then turn it to let down mode in an abnormal way. Then you would turn it to expression mode in an abnormal way. Um, spectral pumps turn off on their own after 30 minutes. So then you would, um, after 30, you would just take it off when you're done. The pump will turn off on its own. Um, and like, I would just say like, if you're going to be exclusively pumping for a long time, so there, there might be like, and, and a medial would work for you, but you just happen to not get one. If you can afford it and whatever, there, there might be some preference for um, investing in a medial if that is possible. Okay, there's obviously a question that arises here of like, I'm pumping because I'm afraid of mastitis. I'm pumping, um, I'm pumping more than my baby is consuming. All of those questions, like just hold on to them. We're coming back to that on Wednesday. Okay, so real talk, why doesn't anybody know about this? Why every time that I talk about this or I post about this or I anything, someone's like, I had three babies and I used to hand pump the entire time and it was miserable. Um, so why doesn't anyone know about this? So one is that half decent electric pumps are basically brand new. And it's just like halacha doesn't like, doesn't catch up that quickly, certainly not written halacha. So just a little like brief history, and this is just like kind of fun, honestly. Um, there's a great article like from, from, uh, from December that came out, like, oh, sorry. Um, hang on, I'm just trying to move these guys. Nope, okay. 
Okay. Anyways, whatever. Um, your faces are covering the top of this slide for me. Um, but like the first pumps cost a thousand Swiss francs, and we're just like, and and like we didn't order us an ad, and we're just completely not usable. And in the eighties, pumps were eight hundred and fifty dollars. They were marketed to hospitals. Only in '96 was the first double electric pump, meaning a double electric pump is a pump that can pump both breasts at the same time, which halves the amount of time it takes to extract milk, um, obviously. And so that's 1996. Like, I was not nursing in 1996, you know, like, I, whatever. Like, that's really, um, that is really not very long ago. Um, and then, really, only in 2012 did it become the case that, like, everyone under the sun has a breast pump because the Affordable Care Act made them free to anybody with insurance, which means also that like, if you're a lactation consultant and you go to someone's home and they're like struggling in the early days with their child, you can all of a sudden be like, you should pump. Like pumping is gonna, you're gonna supplement and you're gonna pump and it's all gonna go great. Like only in a world in which every new mom has an electric breast pump in her home because they're affordable and because that's just like, why not? If it's free, who knows? Maybe I'll need it. Now all of a sudden you're a lactation consultant, you can tell lots and lots and lots of people to start pumping, which means that just more women now in the first, I don't know, whatever, eight weeks of their baby's lives are pumping than ever before. It probably means more women are breastfeeding successfully for longer than ever before also. So it's like a good thing, but it means that when we're talking about the number of women who need to be pumping on Shabbat while their babies are like right there, that number I, I, I would strongly guess has skyrocketed in the last nine years. Um, Okay, so another reason why we never talk about it is because this is an area of halakha that is not modeled. You never see someone else pumping on Shabbat. You'll see women nursing around in shawl or at their houses or whatever, but like very few people pump in public unless they're using like a willow or an LV or a framey. Um, but even then, like you, it's very it's very rare to see someone else pumping on, on Shabbat. Um, a lot of people are not asking questions and they're just assuming I know what the from thing to do is the from thing to do is to not use electricity on Shabbat and then you end up doing like a lot a lot a lot of Yisrael Torah right so that's like like you have to have been working against this in Hilchot Niza a lot like ask questions feel comfortable to ask questions the answer is probably more relaxed than what you would imagine like ask questions that's really what you have to have been pushing for a long time and it's really the same uh the same thing is true here um and again like poor halakhic education about electricity. Um, I think it's just a really big piece of that. Um, I think another big piece of it is that I, I know many women who have asked rabbis and been told things that were not good for their babies. So it's also about when you ask a question, bring all of bring all the information. Don't just say, dear rabbi so-and-so, can I pump on Shabbat? Say, my baby needs my breast milk on Shabbat, can I pump on Shabbat? Say, I'm using this type of pump, how do I use it on Shabbat? They bring, educate the person you're asking questions to because so much has changed so quickly that whatever they learned in Tamika, the world is totally different now from then. Um, and, and, and our understanding of like the science of babies or whatever, like I think a lot of people, you know, like my, our grandparents probably fed all of our parents formula and so that, um, there was an assumption that like, yeah, whatever, just like formula is great. Like uh, we all, uh, lots of people survived on formula and it was awesome. So like that's kind of a, a, an assumption people bring into halakha that's not quite like where a lot of mothers are these days You need the health of their own children. Um, and, um, and so like bring your, bring your knowledge about your health and your child's health into that conversation as well, educate up. Um, so basically it's like a perfect storm where educators can't educate because they're not necessarily up to date and nobody asks them anyways. And so then we end up with like a big, big halakhic mess. So the takeaways are like, please use your electric pump if you need to pump on Shabbos. It's ideal to get a pump that can work on a timer, but if you don't have a pump that can work on a timer, your electric is still better than your manual pump. Um, there are so many reasons why someone might have to pump on Shabbat. When you are an expecting parent, just expect that at some point you may well have to pump on Shabbat. And when you do pump on Shabbat, don't feel guilty. You're doing the right thing for you. You're doing the right thing for your baby. Halakha requires that of you. Parenting infants is hard. We're awesome. And um, we alumni of Yeshivat Maharat and like the greater rabbinic community that I was so touched by how many of our rabbinic colleagues are on this call. They are all awesome too. And you should ask them questions and we're all here for you. Um, and you're invited to be in touch with me. Um, okay, I'm going to stop sharing.
Actually, Leah, if you want to share your reasons for pumping on Shabbat, that would be great because I like that slide. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Carmela Abraham. And I want to thank Leah for her compelling and thoughtful discussion on using electrical pumps on Shabbat. And I've been reading through some of the comments. Um, I won't answer them, but I may comment a little bit about them. And before I comment, the caveat that we've been saying all evening, and I, I want to emphasize that, um, and I want to quote one of my uh, friends who's a respected gynecologist who says, breast is best until it is not. And I want to honor those that choose not to breastfeed or cannot breastfeed. So I just want to say that before I begin. But that's not our discussion tonight. Our discussion tonight is about for those who breastfeed and are pumping uh, for all the reasons above. Um, and I want to comment that in the chat, uh, people commented, well, I could be needing a pump because I am sharing um, uh, 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 nursing a baby or feeding a baby. Uh, one woman uh, who commented about uh, an electrical pump uh, because she has a baby in the neonatal ICU, I can co completely relate to that. Um, I, I had a child who was in the ICU for 10 days and I often talk about the refrigerator of hope where you're nursing for a child who you you know, you hope can get well and you see everybody and you're using probably the strongest, strongest electrical pump you can find known to man in an ICU. So, uh, but uh, I think that um, every woman's journey is different. And I really appreciate Rabanit Leia Sarna's uh, focus on that um, and all the reasons and all, all of the reasons why we come to this, to this day and, and to this question. Ethically, I think it's very clear. The two issues here are the health of the mom and the baby, right? And being able to keep that uh, milk flowing so you can continue to feed uh, the child. So let's just talk about the health of the mom for a second. Um, so lactation mastitis, right? So inflammation of the breast, symptoms are painful, swollen, red breast. Some of the causes can be um, a prior history of mastitis. Um, so Often we see if you had it in one pregnancy, you could have it in another. Um, you could have a poor milk drainage, right? Or a blocked milk duct, right? And so if you're not pumping an engorged breast on Shabbat and you, you're already not comfortable or you're already seeing some symptoms, you can make it worse, right? Any cracked nipples. And now I want to say this because this came up and I want to be, I will always be honest, right? That, um, and it came up in the chat that some pumps, depending on how you put your breast in, electrical pumps can cause nipple damage, right? Which is also a risk factor. So how common, now I'm speaking quickly so we can get some questions in, but how common is lactation mastitis? And from the data I've seen in the recent uh, publication in November, 2020 in Journal of Lactation, it's one to four women um, uh, that can get it, one in four women. Uh, in 26 weeks postpartum. Uh, I see incidence rates from two to 10%, depending on where you're looking. Um, and I just, you know, just again, to add that once women start to have symptoms, they may call their gynecologist, their lactation consultants, and they're told um, cold compresses, NSAIDs, Tylenol, Motrin, and empty that breast, right? Empty that engorged breast, or they will tell you how to hold the baby to kind of help latch on. and and um, but still, um, when you speak to the gynecologist, right, symptoms can persist. Um, and really within 12 to 24 hours, you can get an infectious mastitis that can be really dangerous. Women can have very high fevers. Um, they, um, they have flu-like symptoms. They feel pretty awful in a woman who's already kind of exhausted and kind of tired requiring antibiotics, uh, perhaps a surgical procedure and, um, and uh, hospitalization, right? And that's the issue because then, of course, you're, a woman's life is, you know, you're very sick and it's, it's not good, it's not safe, right? We don't want you to get that sick. Um, but also you, can, you may need to discontinue breastfeeding, right? You may need to, you may not be able to pump in the future. Um, and I wanna say also in the time of COVID, Women in general and men are just not going to the hospitals. Nobody wants to go to the ER. Nobody's looking to, to go in there if they don't have to. And so you could almost imagine women 
um, who uh, may stay home longer or call their gynecologist a little later and try to manage through it. So I, I think that this is a real issue. And I think uh, obviously for some women more than others, but I think there is the women woman's health to consider here. So this makes perfect sense. And then the second piece, which of course is the baby's health and um, the baby's nutrition, right? Um, and we know the multiple benefits of uh, breastfeeding for both the baby and the mom. And I'm not gonna re re regurgitate everything your gynecologist and lactation consultant has told you. And um, again, I say the caveat, you know, having children in their twenties, they all kind of come out the same and you can't even tell who got breastfed and who didn't, but we'll put that to the side for a second. Um, but to keep providing breast milk, right? It's important that you keep that flow up, right? And there are women who just, right, they pump uh, in it to support their nursing or they just pump exclusively and then you have all these other reasons. So to not pump on Shabbat um, is problematic, right? And this is the thing about every day when you have a newborn or an infant in that first year, this is reality. The reality is you're chronically fatigued, you're exhausted and your days are unpredictable. And so no matter how predictable you think your day is gonna be, and you're gonna pump this, 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 things change. The baby doesn't nurse, the baby's not well, you have other children, you have work-life work balance issues, you have parents, right? People are in sandwich generations. So you could find all of a sudden that you have an engorged breast that you didn't expect, right? If things don't work in the way you planned. So, I want to factor in uh, these factors of fatigue, exhaustion. You may forget to eat and drink enough, right? You're, you're trying to produce. You may not produce. You don't. You don't. Maybe you have don't have consistent production. There's lots of reasons why you would need to pump, and um, and these factors are just as real real during the week, and they're just as real on Shabbat. So being able to pump on Shabbat. Um, is really important uh, using an electrical pump uh, to preserve not only a woman's health, but baby's nutritional uh, needs um, and that breast milk. Rabbi Lea Sarna has provided a thoughtful way to use electric pumps on Shabbat with deep consideration of halacha and kudos to her for bringing this to our attention and having this discussion this evening. So I would like to give this back to um, the host, I think that's Jen, Hi, and yeah. she will ask questions. And thank you, thank you to Maharat for opening up this discussion. Thank you all. Thank you so much to Rabbi Dr. Aaron Leib Smokler, Rabbi Neet Leia Sarna, Rabbi Dr. Carmela Abraham. Um, Rabbi Leah, there were a number of questions for you in the chat. So if you want to scroll back, we do have five more minutes. If there's any in particular that you would like to go ahead and answer, I'm going to take a moment and just talk a bit more about the series while you skim back through. And let me let me know if you're interested, if there's a question or two you might be able to answer. Um, Great. We, oh, sorry. oh, just one thought. Um, so this is the first in a three-part series. So the next session is this coming Wednesday and the following is the following Wednesday. Um, the next session will be focused on saving milk from Shabbat and also donated breast milk. And the third session will be on breastfeeding in public spaces in synagogue and while learning. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for all three. If you did not register for this evening um, or for future sessions, please go ahead and take a moment to register. We'll be sending out the recording to everyone who registered. And also that will make sure that you have the links for the upcoming sessions. If you just scroll back up in the chat, um, I did put the registration link there and I'll pop it back in. Um, Robin Eatley, I'll let you go ahead and do a question answering. Um, yeah, so there are a few questions here I want to get to. Um, I want to talk about the willow and the LV for a second. Um, I um, actually just don't know enough about those pumps, um, but anything that requires like a lot of like, like with those ones, you're moving around the electric like pump part of it. Uh, meaning like with a spectra, you could just like leave your spectra somewhere um, and um, and like only the like detachable parts that you like wash and that are like the, only the like um the parts of like the valves and the duck bill and the 
bottle part, would you have to like take off and on on Shabbat and you could actually just like leave the pump sitting there, you wouldn't have to move it. So from that perspective, you probably have some like mukta benefits um, from using like a, a pump that you're not moving around versus a pump that's like a well or an LV. I think wells and LVs also you probably would need to charge over the course of Shabbat. I don't, I don't know, like maybe, maybe the one charge would be enough to get you through a full day. That's, that's part of the thing that I don't, I don't know, but like, you don't really want to be like unplugging, yes, plugging, all that stuff. I'd also say like Lowe's and LV is not covered by your insurance. So you'll probably end up with both. Meaning if you get a will and an LV, you probably also have like a Spectra or a Vidula or something in that direction at home. So my, if, if you can, and, and, if, and I'm sure I could be convinced that there's some reason why you would need to use a will and an LV on Shabbat. And in that case, just like do as many to Akhariyad, like, she knew him as you possibly can and turning them off and on and using them. Um, okay, so why is a manual pump certainly prohibited at the same or higher level than electricity? The manual pump is only mefaric, whereas the electric pump is mefaric plus maybe electricity. So, okay, so let's try and be clear about that. When your electric pump is doing mefaric, it's your electric pump that's doing the mefaric and you're just the one pressing the buttons. So that's definitely like one step removed and also, your electric pump is doing the like pump, 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 pump. Whereas, um, and so you just press like, let's say you're using a spectra, you press three buttons in order to get there, as opposed to every time that you do a, um, every time that you do a singular pump on your, um, on your manual pump, that is another like act of mufaric. So you might say, and this, some authorities do say this, uh, but every act of mufaric doesn't produce like a shear of, of milk. So they like somehow decided that a shear of, of breast milk is a gregarit, like the size of like a date, like a like a big thing. And um and in that case, like yeah, every one is like a chatsi shear. Whereas like when you do when you use your electric your electric pump, like you're doing like a full like creation of a circuit or whatever by turning it on. So um I don't like that maybe those people would say that you have to empty the bottle after each like date's worth like you can't allow it to like a mass in the in the bottle of the in the bottom of your pump um so if you want to do that like power to you and i'm happy to um i'm happy to to send you sources if you find that compelling um i think those were like the two main ones and i think we're kind of at, at time but i'm happy mm -hmm. to like be available to people sarna at drisha.org it's good to see a lot of drisha on my hair always um, and um, so if you had a question that did not get answered, you're welcome to email it. I just put my email address into the chat. So you're welcome to email a question that maybe you put into the chat and it didn't get answered or that you're still holding. And I'm happy to either redirect it to someone who could answer and or um, try to make sure that it gets answered in future sessions. So again, if you did not register for this evening, please do so so that we can send you the recording and also so that you'll get information about the next two sessions. And if there's a topic that's burning for you that you're really interested in learning more about that you think there's maybe some communal interest in, we would love to hear about that. So again, my email is in the chat. Please feel free to reach out and um, share your thoughts, share your ideas because we are eager and happy to um, um, share Torah and share learning that meets the community's needs. Thank you all for being with us tonight and we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday.